Sweet. So just catch, now that we're recorded, just to catch people up, I was just talking about, um, I think I got, I think I'm getting clear about the next piece I want to write, um, which, which has to do with uh, philosophy as a, as kind of, you could say, as the practice of human being, right? Um, and there's a way where Perot, is it, I, am I, I don't think I'm saying his name, the French guy talks about you know, showed how philosophy historically was was always more considered not an academic, um, an a academia of producing doctrines and stuff like that. That came way, way later. Originally, philosophy was a um, kind of a radical, a radical practice, right? That was that was about people's development, right? And um, it was much more like a kind of, you could say, a spiritual discipline. Um, and so, but, but there's something about his work that also I feel like misses something, right? Because my experience with philosophy, um, and I think, especially for me, because I didn't come, I, I didn't come at, I didn't come at philosophy through, through academia, right? I kind of came through it through just, you know, having a life of sustaining a ton of pain and hell and coming through the other side of it. And, um, you know, like a, an innate curiosity that that's in wonder about things despite the hell <laughs> and mm -hmm. because of the hell, right. Um, and through circling and the people that I met that I just got, I, I, I uh, a friend of mine had bought a Heidegger book and, and I remember I just something, something about it spoke to me and I just started reading Heidegger. And then that, that, that experience of opening to philosophy, um, even though I didn't understand why, I didn't understand really what I was reading, right? I didn't see how it had relevance to anything I was doing really. Um, but as it, as time went on, I realized that the, 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 the personal change that happened through grappling with Heidegger and other philosophers um, is really kind of what I think in so many ways allowed circling to come together as a practice, right? In a way that I wasn't aware of until probably three years into it. Um, and so I've asked, so, so, so for me on a personal level, there's been a way from, from like the, really from the ground up, it's been, a philosophy and say personal development, like are, I mean, they've just been hand in hand throughout the whole thing. And so what's been great about doing these videos, right? Is that I, it's just kind of on its own. I, I didn't even intend to do philosophical videos, right? Um, but that's what we just ended up talking about. I just ended up meeting all these people such as yourself and so this has really been the first time in my life that I've actually had other people that I could, I could talk to, right? Like in the way that with as much fury as I actually want to talk about it, right? And mm -hmm. engage with it. But I really hadn't had that except for like a few friends here or there, right? Most of the, most of how it would come out was, you know, was what, what that thinking provided, right? Um, and so circling and the way I saw and things like that, which are really valuable to people. But my, I find that most people, most people are intimidated by philosophy. Most people don't get the point, right? Most people don't, I don't think actually perceive what it is. Um, uh, and, but I have a feeling that like, man, if more people really understood what philosophy points to, um, I think it would, people would respond, a lot more people would respond very differently to it. Um, and, and that it's like that this kind of sense in which I, I, even deeper than what Perot says, like my sense is to be a human being, right? Is to be a is to be a philosophical conversation, right? In other words, 
like mm -hmm. philosophy is is not like a conversation that you could have or not have right and you can have other conversations and but there's something about where philosophy comes from and what it addresses and it's that's particularly human right that to be a human being is to is to is to dwell in, in in on the very ground of philosophy itself. In other words, you can't not not be a philosopher in some sense, right? Even if you turn away from it, right? Like even that's given by it, right? So I I I feel like I wanna I wanna I've been and I, I've been I want to wrestle that wrestle this out into more into con coherence and unconcealment about what. What exactly is that sense? Um, and so I've been reading different philosophers and, but from the standpoint of, of being, staying aware that they're, um, that they're, for example, they're, what I'm reading is that they're actually giving a lecture. And, and so being present to that there's a pedagogy, right? That there's, that they're on some level aware of that I'm reading it and whoever's listening to them that they're learning something. And so there's a, there's a, there's a way that they see it either consciously or unconsciously that gives how they present it and what they talk about and, and like, and start to abstract. I want to kind of pull some of those threads out of like, what is that? What is the pedagogy? Right. Um, because my sense is that you can actually do philosophy, right. In one sense where you can, you know, I'm thinking more like kind of like the analytic tradition, right? Um, where you kind of get the sense that you could put time into reading texts and become familiar with the vernacular and put together arguments and do that kind of thing, but not really be changed by it, right? To, mm. and, I, and I actually wonder if that's actually philosophy. My sense is like, the, the genuine primordial sense of, you know, philia sophia, right, has to do with to learn. How you know that you've learned is to be altered, profoundly altered by what you learn. Like, it, it's like you have to, in order to understand some of these things, the understanding of, of these things are the, you start to start to understand and address the way that you understand, right? And if you start to get understand the way that you understand, right? That implicitly changes your relationship to everything mm. that you understand, right? You st in other words, you start to become someone different, right? Through this kind of engagement. Um, I also have a feeling that when people don't have this in their life right in some form or another i just have a feeling it's not it's not like if we say philosophy is a capacity an innate capacity that we have right to wonder um i have a feeling that if you don't use it it's not like it just it just lays there right neutral i have a feeling it actually goes sour Right. Mm. It's like one of those things that you can't just not use it. You know, if the, the not using it is already an act, right? Cause that's why I think it's like, that's why I think it's more of an ontolog. It's like, we're ontologically philosophical in that sense. So in this article, I think I want to start to draw that out. I think that's similar to, to your body, right? You cannot not use your body in a sense. Right. And if yeah. you if you treat your body in a, in a bad fashion, then you yeah. I don't know you you become fat or or yeah. you just become unhealthy. And yeah. and so is this this organ. Let's call it organ. Mm -hmm. uh, this organ of philosophy, mm. whatever this is. Mm. It's also we we have to train it right, and, and we have to right. attend to it. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it degenerates, and then then we we become unwise and, and don't know what's going on. Yeah, totally. Closed, probably we get closed, we get rigid, we get unconscious, right? Uh, mm. We fall, all the things about falling asleep, I think all the, emo and all the emotional disorders that come with that, right? 
because yeah, it does mm. it does seem like to to to, to genuinely inquire to, to to genuinely dwell in with deep questions right is is to do that with your whole being right i it, just that in terms of an exercise i think you echo the machinery john this is john speak but he talks a lot about like the machinery you use to have philosophical dialogue, right? Are all these machineries that are the same, it's the same mechanisms and organs and capacities that, that, that some people would call the same ones that have one enlightened, a person develop, yeah. right? Um, but it's also, it also takes courage to really do it, right? It really does take courage and a relationship with the unknown. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing, like the relationship with the unknown becomes, it, 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 it because you get, it's like, it's almost like, de like developing a love affair with the unknown. Mm. Right. Like kind of innocent, it's like wedded, becoming wedded to what's concealed. Right. And then, and then starting to relate to it and and, and see it, it's that the whole, whole process is the world reveals itself mm. like then all of a sudden i look up in the mirror and i'm no longer the same person right mm. without even noticing that what what tell me a little bit about your personal experience with how, how did you get into philosophy and that, that's a good question i i kind of like had this feeling of kind of like that we live in an age of a spiritual malaise in a sense yeah. kind of like I, 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 when I was in high school I thought a lot about um, you know the war crimes and everything that has gone wrong in the last century mm -hmm. and this kind of like I, the first experience was kind of like okay something massive is going on underneath yeah. and, and it's still it's still going on I had this when when 9/11 hit in, was in America. I, I had this kind of deep sense, whatever was before, this is all connected in a weird way and still going on. Um, but I really, I really, I mean, I, I read just because I wanted to find out more about religion as a phenomenon. I started right. reading books like Nishitani. Yeah, because it, it mean the title in German is is what is religion, and right. that's also the original title in in Japanese. Huh. I, I also started reading people like Augustine or so, huh. or, or Schopenhauer. Yeah, how how long ago kind was this? Like, this was when I was eighteen mm -hmm. or right. nineteen or so yeah. around that that time. Yeah, and. kind of then i read dostoevsky as well mm -hmm. and that kind of like also kind of like had hit me like a bus <laughs> right, right. So, so especially the brothers karamasov is like yeah right right totally. <laughs> just 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 your whole world view explodes and and yeah. and also just just what 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 one person can write i, I had no idea that that this is possible yeah and then he wrote four books like that right yeah yeah it was amazing um, mm. so, it, so I, it sounds like it sounds like there's the out of that sense of malaise right of modernity yeah, but when I something think about of, that right when i think of my life i think everything i did was in kind of a sense of response to that Mm -hmm. this primordial feeling of we have no ground and and because we are having no ground in a sense mm -hmm. chaos comes to the fore yeah in in period like periodically yeah sometimes yeah. a little bit more and sometimes a little bit less yeah. i was just also shocked by the brutality that had kind of erupted in the in the in the last century yeah yeah. And I mean, this was this was not long ago in the Second World War. Right. But no. That kind of like that brutality was something that uh, I could not fathom in a sense. We're still um, barely, barely even catching our breath from that. Yeah. In terms of yeah. time, right? Like, I, 
I don't mm -hmm. even think that we've actually gotten that that just happened, right? Mm. Two world wars, right? And everything that came with that, just that just happened. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, it's 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 like it's like it's it, in in like human history, evolutionary history. It's like this was a blink of an eye. And mm -hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. So when people like Johannes also talk about the, the explosion of modernity, mm -hmm. um, kind of like that was really an explosion. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, I think that's, that's why we need these, we need to, to find the ground again. And I think the, the practices of philosophy, but also of religion, and I would, I would put them together like the Japanese philosophers did. For them, this was not this was not like two separate things. This was one thing. Yeah. Yeah. When you are doing philosophical practice or argumentation, you're also kind of involved in, in a religious project. Yeah. And it's kind of you're you're bound to the world and and, and you 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 try that everything comes together in a sense. You 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 bind the world together. Right. Instead of trying, in, instead of like helping in the movement that facilitates this, mm. this ripping apart of everything. Mm. Mm. And um, you're saying that the 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 impulse, right? The 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 desire to to write all that stuff and to read and to read philosophy. That that fundamentally, what you're saying is that impulse is a religious one. I think so. Yeah, that coming together, right, versus dispersing into into chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because every time we speak of religion, and that this is from the Shitania, like mm -hmm. you know, the, the the book starts with what is religion, and and also what is my purpose to something beyond. Yeah, yeah. and every time we speak of this moreness. Whatever, whatever it is, let's say also it's this unconcealment, it's the mystery that the presence is yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, however we want to call this, when you attune to it, I think yeah. then you're you're in something right. like religious practice. It's, there we go. And it's that primordial attunement, right? Mm. Right. It's that primordial attunement out of which philosophy, right? I think mm -hmm. comes is that particular attunement, what, whether or not it's the wonder side or the horror side, right? The, the, um, that, yeah, there's, there is a way we were talking about this earlier where, you know, Heidegger, I think, you know, one of the big things that he did is he started to kind of presence how Dasein, right? Is the, it, it is the site where being gets to be, mm. right? It's like, a, um, I, he's not saying that if there wasn't even being, there wouldn't be anything. It's nothing like that. He's just saying that like that, that, that human beings are something like the cosmos's way of becoming the world. Like beings get to arise within our transcendence, right? Um, mm. And that, and that's, and that's our pri that's primordially what makes us the kinds of beings that we are, human beings, right? We are the site for all that is to to come into appearance, right, and to come into mm -hmm. relation, to gather, right. Um, and in that sense, this is what I this is what I was talking about. In that sense, there is a way in which being, in some sense, needs us, right? There's some kind of primordial. Need, like need or claim that being what is to be a being a human being is to be that being which being claims right um and so i think philosophies is out of that claim it's this this sense of pressure if you will to respond to let to to, to let the mystery kind of unfold into coherence of some kind right like on one level, you could say we're doing that. That's about us. But on another level, I think it's probably even 
more true or more telling that it's that that it's actually it's the need of being for us right that it's the claim of being right that that uh uh that is really what this is about right on some level mm. Mm -hmm. also in the sense that the gods come to us when we want to talk in that language. right right totally that the... <laughs> yeah that what, why why are so many myths that that the gods look on the fear like the fears of human drama and they kind of like look at that and, and want to be part of that right. why 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 does god want to become human right that is because we we, right. we 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 are limited creatures and we we have tragedy and drama and there's always something going on in in the in the human world yeah it's it's never boring in that sense. Men yeah. became boring. In the, <laughs> yeah. Boring as a phenomenon really became an issue in the 19th century, I would yeah. say. So, so yeah. Kierkegaard also writes about that. Yeah. But um, it's, it's usually it's never boring when in the human world. And there's always something going on. And, and, and we are mortal and we, we can suffer. But we, we are also when something wondrous happens, we are like, whoa, whoa, that's so cool. And, and yeah. We, we, yeah. We, 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 we can feel ecstasy and we can, right. 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 Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And all of that, that all of that we can find in, in the, in the ancient myths. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this kind of like primordial astoundment that Heidegger also saw mm. that we, we are forgetting that for some mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. And then, then he tries to write it out again and maybe make us a little bit more aware yeah. of, of yeah. this wonder of, of yes. what, what, what is there just, right. let's say, being. Right. And it seems to do that. It seems to seduce us, right? Like Socrates talked a lot about that. Eros, mm. right, is is, you know, he would seduce his interlockers, right, into a world where they couldn't, that arrows, they, it needed to acknowledge, needed to awaken erotically for them, right? And arrows has always that quality of, on one level, it addresses, right? It comes and it draws you into relation, but it, it simultaneously withdraws at the same time, right? Mm. And that- gets yeah, both, yeah. Right. So in some sense that, you know, I think that, <laughs> oh, am I, how's my internet? No, no, I had a, I had a lag. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, cool. <laughs> my, my internet, my internet lagged. Okay. Got gotcha. you. So gotcha. I couldn't hear what, what you were saying. Yeah. But I was saying uh, that essentially that's a big part of it of how, how one comes into philosophy is 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 through eros. It's like eros touches you, right? And it's mm. but there is this quality of eros where it, what makes it erotic is is it simultaneously comes into a dress but also pulls away. And so there's this mm. intrigue, right? And in that intrigue, you start to go into this whole world that opens up into all these other things, right? And there's also this other part, isn't there? Do you, do you, do you recall this? Um, I think it's Ivo de Janeiro made a connection. And I, and I think he referred it to, um, I think it's possibility. And the etymology of possibility is connected to likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you get all the way down and it, and it essentially like, that, that possibility, right, has been, you know, from his vantage point, because of that was the big thing that Heidegger showed that human beings, one, is, is, is it's all about possibility. Everything that we do, right, is, mm. is, is we're always already on the way in, into what's possible, right? And ch you change your, like you change in history, the sense of what's possible changes, the human being is bound in that change. You have different, a different way of being in relationship. It's all possibility. But I think what De Janeiro is talking about was like, actually no possibility though has a different sense, right? 
what, what possibly Heidegger meant is more like no possibility was more like it's connected to like. And it's in a sense, in a sense, it's like possibility is the way that being loves the sign, right? It's a, there's a, uh, and I think it gets in that uh, sense, right? The it, likelihood. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. yeah, that sense of which, which I mean, because so much of human beings, I mean, to be human, I mean, we're the most vulnerable creatures on the, like, on the planet. Like, we're pathetic, right? <laughs> on so many, <laughs> so many different levels. Like, we are, it's, it, 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 it's precisely, I think, our death and our vulnerability that, um, afford something like existence, right? For being to be able to exist, right? It's precisely that connection in, in, in our, and that for most, like most of us are not actual. Like most of, most of our being is not actual in a world. We're, we're not a thing. Most of us are really grounded in nullity we're grounded in emptiness we're grounded in like a po we're grounded in possibility right we're totally oriented towards now towards not i just had a uh, conversation with um cory anton and he just released his 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 new book it's called how how being how was it how nothing how nothingness haunts being, right? That sense of, mm. and that's precisely, it's that nothingness, it's that orientation towards it that seems um, to be the clearing, right? Such that uh, the sunset can like have a, have a perspective, right? Have a, li a limit upon which it can show, right? And shine as a sunset, right? Hmm. like this has a lot to do with like the it's, it's precisely our mortality right our our limits our vulnerability that is that being in some sense yearns right for us i also hmm. feel like with the two fingers it's like if you look at the two it's like there's adam who's just kind of like barely like barely lifted figure and then there's god like going whoa he's got angels and like he's <laughs> hmm. It, that and, and that portrayal, me, God wants man a hell of a lot more than man wants God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think this comes even in Corbeau at one point, though I'm not I'm not sure with the reference there. Um, but it's some there's some creation myth in in Islamic mysticism that some God longed for man, yearned for man. And thus he, he 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 put himself into the world, right? Because he was so alone in, in his perfection, in a sense, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and we as human beings, that that's that's I think where this sense of play or serious play comes into to mm -hmm. because when we are children, we 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 do this intuitively. We we in gauge playfully with being or with yeah. the world right yeah and kind of like we lose this sense yeah and in and then then we become ignorant <laughs> yeah totally, totally and and that's i think then then philosophy comes into play mm -hmm. because then then it's it's all about we have to relearn yeah to attune again to the wonder of the world and to actually care for it yeah yeah. So this this yearning, so be, let's say being yearns for us, mm -hmm. and but we do not necessarily yearn for being. Yeah. And when yeah. we forget that, mm -hmm. that's kind of like the cave myth. Could yeah. Also, really like that when we can't see the light anymore, or yeah. don't want to see it, or can't bear it. Yeah. Um, then it's becoming darker, and then then the darkness uh, yeah. rises. Right, right. And that, that's, that's then when philosophy becomes such a necessary thing. Ooh. And then it's also, you, you like being that much, although you don't know nothing about it, 
mm-hmm. let's say you, you yeah. like the world let's say so much but you you, you know nothing about it right right you, you know maybe you have this as a sense when, when you're young as some some sometimes you, you think you know everything right yeah Kind of like when, when like an 80, 18 year old atheist comes along because they, they I don't know listen to Sam Harris yeah, yeah. and now they think now they think I can debunk God and I'm <laughs> 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 no you can <laughs> um, right, right but but then then at some point this this kind of like this kind of like from this stance of I know everything and then yeah. this turns and then you know nothing. Yeah. But you're, you're still in a, in a place of wonder and it yeah. shines in but you don't know what this shining is in a sense yeah and totally. then, then you want to then you want to become proficient as a lover of wisdom right we, you have to train it right you, yeah. you have to have to practice it yeah so you can bear to see the light yeah and that's the practice of philosophy totally isn't it isn't it in a lot of the older Christian traditions. You know, I know in America, there's a lot of, you know, with the evangelistic and, you know, the kind of Protestant sect, there's a lot of like, God's your buddy. You know, you have a personal, you ask him for things Mm. and that kind of thing. But my understanding is like the older Orthodox prayer was Mm. really more about like what you were really praying for is basically it comes from this, God's trying to get in, but you're fucking, you're running away or you're blocking them. There's a, there's this, there's this way in which there's, there's this profound sense in which God is, is wants to enter into your heart, if you will, in that terminology, right? It wants to dwell deep in, 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 in become you in some sense. Mm -hmm. And that it's like, and that what you're praying for is the is deliverance over all the different ways that you block that, right? Um, which is a very, and I think it starts to get in this this sense in which there is a kind of pressure to be a human being, right? Like there, there's there's a, in fact, it's 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 so primary this pressure that comes with being, right? That people mm. just don't even notice it anymore. They just don't hear it. They don't understand it. They're constantly in relationship with it or responding to it, but they don't under they don't really kind of get the sense in which at the bottom of it, a human being is we like to think of ourselves like a like an object, right? Like I'm a thing in the world and you put the thing down and like you can move it around and and if you turn around and you leave it alone for a while and you turn back, it'll still be there. Man, but what just just look what what, what happens? Just say that you just, you just sat on your couch and you did that right for you know a couple months. And you just didn't do anything. Your whole life would fall apart, hmm. right? Like if you think about no, there's a there's a constant there's a constant way in which we are we aren't actual in that sense. We don't we don't kind of, we don't, we don't, we aren't an end product, right? We're always underway. We're always, right? We're always uh, in the presence of our capacity to be, our ability to be, right? Possibilities are speaking to us. We're resisting them. The whole thing is this, this constant, I don't know if you call it movement, but it's this constant this constant sense of concern and care, mm. right? And there's no escaping it. It's what makes us human, but we're not things, mm. <laughs> right? We like to think we're things. Mm. What came to me was this quote from Meister Eckhart, I believe. Well, it was like, God is always at home. It is we who, who have gone out for a walk. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So it's just interesting to think about that for me of just that sense of of like all of all of the reading and everything that we're doing in some ways is trying to like almost thin the boundary between me and everything out such that I, it could get in right such that the 
the shining could show right that but that most of my fallenness is all about habitual ways of turning away from it right all these mm. different ways where i fall short or i sin or whatever it is that you want to call it right but just this idea that no actually no there's a like that's what i think de, de janeiro is getting at the possibility is actually essentially essentially is the way that being loves you it's like it wants to come into being through you it's you are the vulnerability or the opening that allows that to happen right like and and so in that sense there's a way in which you know there is this one part i think oftentimes it it comes across as like this pressure to be someone right like all these you know most people are walking around with this enormous pressure in this fear about not being enough or or this pressure to be extraordinary or 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 this kind of background um barely audible sense of pressure to 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 in some sense justify your existence right and at the same time though it's kind of a funny way to go about it because it's like like you're already more than you could ever accomplish right like like there's nothing that you anything that you do presupposes that you are right like and that is just the fact of the fact that you are right there's nothing that you can do to to um, uh, <laughs> to pay it back right there's nothing that you could do to earn it right like there's nothing it's you're already more than you could ever do right so when i think about that well what well what is the what is what is the more authentic way of of responding to that pressure and i think what i've been kind of getting more, more and and this has to do with you know now being in the second half of my life i really kind of like I, my sense of self used to be like, a, I always felt like my sense of self when I was younger was almost like the, a dog in heat constantly, like, you know, pump, like humping my leg. It just had all its needs and it needed to be important and like all that kind of stuff. And in and, and the second half of my life so far, it seems like there's more of a sense in which that it seems like the ethic, right, is more has to do with developing my capacities, those capacities to, um, to become more of a profound observer, right? To be the sight, right? And the, to bear witness to, to the fact of my existence, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I get to say what I think about it. Right. There's a, there's a sense of being a witness and giving testimony to it. Right. And there's one way that, well, that'll just happen because I'm a human being and I have senses and I'm constituted this way, but there's also another way in where if you really are yourself. Right. And I think that this is the locus of the conversations that we're having. It's like on one level, we're talking about stuff that we really want to know about, but it's the process of who we get to become in talking about this. Right like our ability to perceive, our ability to be more in our heart, our ability to, to be more voluntarily vulnerable with courage, right? To become a better listener, like a better observer, right? Um, to have more and more distinctions such that you can see more, right? And, and there's a sense in which that beauty, I sometimes feel like the experience of of profound beauty that one feels, right? When that witnessing really happens. I don't think that that's a subjective experience. I think that's something like the world's rejoicing, right? And being seen. Like at some level, I almost feel, I, I know Gerta mm -hmm. talked a lot about this in his science, scientific work, which not many people know, know much about his scientific work, but you know, he, uh, in a lot of that scientific work, he would, he would talk about it 
in terms of, you know, to give, to give your sense of I over to nature. So fully, right, that the experience of revelation, right, of when nature glows, right, is the, is the rejoice, is when that happened, when you really do give your eye, right, over to nature, it's like it gets to glow, right, and that experience of beauty and these really rich, profound experiences is the, is, as you could say, is like the evidence of the world, right, mm. got to be in you in some way. Mm. So it's so interesting. It reminded me of um, an interview I saw with Marie-Louise von Franz, who was one of uh, Jung's most important students. So she worked alongside with Carl Jung for many, many, many mm. years. And she said in an interview that she thinks because we have lost our connection with nature, mm -hmm that all of these neuroses came up in the in the last 200 years right and then then we i think she, she thought that then we would also not fear death that much if we would be more grounded in nature yeah. what you said is also this you know when your eye is melting away mm. that's often when you when you are in nature when you're just mm. in nature when you're just i don't know you're, you're walking up a, a mountain let's say mm -hmm. then when you're on the top of the mountain you see the sun mm -hmm. and and or you, you look down on the country and then you you feel this profound wonder that yeah you feel everything is right right and these yeah, yeah. these experiences then put you out of yourself and, and as you say you, you you are given back to nature in a sense yeah yeah um seems to me that we have lost it for some reason oh yeah a lot a lot collapsed in <laughs> 200 years ago i don't know mm -hmm. a lot collapsed there yeah. um yeah but <clears throat> i think yeah everything you said is just right then then being encounters being or world comes to world and that's the worlding mm -hmm. yeah and in some sense i get this even when when sometimes in some of nishitani's sentences this that the world is worlding right this this he also writes this and how i mean he, he talks about the dropped off body mind right mm. from from dogen yeah. yeah so this kind of like everything drops off you feel as if you're there with empty hands yeah but but then then it's it's like this opening is is occurring and yeah it's just that right it seems to me it's just it's just that and and if we can yeah, yeah if we don't yeah, this sense what you're talking about, that you think you always have to do something, mm -hmm. you always have to be more, and you know. Um, sometimes it just seems to me that, that mm. it's also from, from the, the pressure on subjectivity. Oh, yeah. Because, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that, totally. that really increased it because if you, let's say, if you are embedded in a world mm -hmm. let's say in a, in a medieval town you have the mm -hmm. church and then i mean you i think i think you, you never had kind of like this mm -hmm. self-importance yeah um because you you always have a sense okay there's god and, and i'm i'm a part of god mm -hmm. i'm equal i'm equal in the sense that i have a relation i can have a relation to god yeah um so yeah. I think this this kind of like self importance that that's mm. and, and right it's always it, it that's always like in a contradiction because at one mm. sense you say oh you have to you have to beat out the competition and become the best and yeah. and and then at the same time be nice to everyone and and treat treat each other kindly but even these things that they don't go hand in hand right so yeah. it's always it's always a conflict in yeah. that sense. <laughs> yeah totally totally 
Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, Ger that's actually, when I think about it, that Goethe's scientific work is just fascinating, you know, because he had this way of, you know, this thing, he used to do this thing, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to do it any justice, but it's something like where he, he had a, a way of doing science where he would study plants, right? And he would, um, he wanted to, he would seek to behold the species of the plant, right? Which is, it, it's only disclosed in all of its different stages, but, but he's saying that like, no, there's a way that you can actually, it can unfold, right? Mm. And you can grok the, you could say the concept, right? That the precept of the plant. But he, and he said, you know, cause if you think about it, most of the time when we look around and we perceive the most simple, like we, we perceive, <clears throat> Man, human made things completely different than we perceive nature right so it's kind of like i see the chair i don't see a, a like an appendage of a bunch of plastic and things no i see a chair right so i'm really more reading and i i read it when because i understand the function of the chair that's kind of like the meaning of the chair is is the function so i actually like the, the shape of the chair is more like the letters and the, the sentence composition and stuff like that, right? That's more of when we, when we look at and perceive human things, that's, it's mostly reading in that way. Mm. And he's, and, and Goethe noticed that we don't really do that with nature, right? And, and he says that how we have like normal science tries to understand nature by like measuring the shapes of the letter right? Like categorizing it and all, all that kind of stuff, right? And of course, which isn't really reading it. So Goethe's sense is like, well, can we read the sacred text of nature, right? And so mm -hmm. that's what a lot of his scientific work was about is like wholly giving your attention over, right? To the plant and as it grows, right? And like fully, fully giving you, giving it, it's your eye, right? And at the moment when it receives it, there's it, you can, you can actually perceive the, you can perceive the oak species, right, through it. I've practiced that a bunch. It's, it's actually quite amazing. Um, but that's the whole thing about reading, you know, reading, reading the, the sacred text of nature in that way, like is, mm. you know, and that's a, another example of in that sense where you know, being human is really not about being someone, right? It's more about realizing a world, right? I think that's also the case in fact, the, why the best experiences of ourselves are always those experiences in which we didn't occur to ourselves, right? Like mm. flow states, those kinds of things, right? Like we're just, we're just not objects, right? that we stand over and against, we, we think about ourselves like that, but that's actually just primordially not the case. That's not the way that we are. It seems, it seems like the more authentic way to really be a human being is to really, really be a prof much like a, a wise, profound witness to it all, right? In a big way. Mm. So get, kind of getting into this pedagogy thing that I was talking about, like, I'm going to read you. Um, I sent this, I sent you this book. I will download it. Okay. Just now. Let me see if it, this is, uh... and actually I'm going to pause it for one second. I have to grab some water. Okay. Recording. So it says, And this is the book, uh, I think it's it called like Heidegger's Pedagog Pedag Pedagogy, I think is what it's called. Um, it's page five. The problem of the beginning. For the, for the reader of Heidegger's work, especially being in time, the topic that is to be addressed under the, the rubric of philosophic pedagogy is first encountered in the problem of the beginning. As it exists for the reader who wants to understand the work, that is, 
someone who wants to take part in the inquiry that the work proposes to initiate and so approach the matters themselves with understanding. The presentation of being in time very explicitly differs from the early modern claims to posit principles as known with certainty and then proceed in inductively or deductively towards an account of the whole of what can be known. In contrast, this work takes as its starting point a projection. This is the part that struck me. In contrast, this work, being in time, takes as its starting point a projection, a priori understanding of the being of beings, including the being of man, and then proceeds to analyze the con constitution of being, of this being, from out of these guiding ontological assumptions. The movement of the work is neither an ascent towards nor a descent from first principles, but rather a circular movement in which the guiding projections are gradually clarified through a disclosure of their presuppositions. Philosophy will never seek to deny its presuppositions, but neither may it simply admit them. It conceives them and it unfolds with more and more penetration, both the presuppositions themselves and that for which they are, pre they are presuppositions. While indeed presuppos the presuppositions of the ontological interpretation become conceived through the movement of the interpretation of Dasein, they do not have the character of conceptual propositions about things or ideas. Rather, the presuppositions have the character of ways in which Dasein itself is, i.e. it exists. Such modes of existing are presuppositions for and of the guiding ontological projection of the idea of being in general and the idea of existence. The fundamental presupposition here is then conceived as the authentic, finite, temporal, historical existence of Dasein. One could also say a way of being of the one who philosophizes. The presupposition of the inquiry as a way of existence thus proceeds, precedes the work and as it were, stands outside the work in which it is conceived, unfolded and fulfilled. The conceptual interpretation clarifies and secures the presuppositions may suffice to demonstrate that the work does not ultimately proceed from any arbitrary construction. Yet, um, explication of the presuppositions of ontological interpretation is itself carried out on the level of formal indicative existential ontological discourse. This might at first seem, seem to suggest that the reader could acquire a proper philosophical ontological understanding of existence through a thoughtful reading of the work alone. But if the fundamental presupposition of ontological understanding is not a mode of conceiving finite existence as a whole by way of being existing as a whole, a way of existing temporally and historically, such that the phenomena of temporality and historicity first become accessible. Then it is by no means clear that the presentation of ontological interpretation can provide the conditions under which a reader could participate in the interpretation with understanding. As Heidegger says, with respect to the existential ontological interpretation of conscience, quote, 
just as little as existence is necessary and directly impaired by any ontologically inadequate way of understanding the conscience so little does an existentially appropriate interpretation guarantee that one has understood the call in an existential, existential manner. Indeed, the problem of beginning here intensifies to the extent that it becomes clear that without existential understanding, all analysis of, of existence remains groundless. Here, ground or soil means the phenomenal ground. To be grounded means to have a footing in the matters themselves. The question then remains, how is it possible for a Dasein to participate in the interpretation of the constitution of being of, of Dasein so that it may decide of its own accord whether as the being which it, which it is, it has that constitution of being. Mm. Anything for, for you stand out with us? Just a question. Um, did you continue reading or did you read the book as a whole already or not? I'm about, I'm about halfway through. Hmm. So on the, this last question, how is it possible for a Dasein to participate in the interpretation of the constitution of the being of Dasein. Does he give an answer to that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we're I think we're circling around it. Well, the thing that stood mm. out for me about this was this part. It's this 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 different way of working that Heidegger does, right, in multiple different ways, right? Of, in contrast, this work takes as instead of having propositions that we're clear about and that we know and then and then and then running through the, the topic inductively or deductively in terms to prove those propositions as knowing um, instead this work takes as a starting point a projection a prior understanding of the being of beings including the being of man and then proceeds to analyze the constitution of the being of this being from out of these guiding ontological assumptions. The movement of the work is neither an ascent towards nor a descent from first principles, but rather a circular movement in which the guiding projections are gradually clarified through a disclosure, disclosure of their presuppositions. This is why I think. This is this is why I think learning about, say, the being of beings that that we're inquiring about. If you do it this way, um, you you do it through discovering it in your own being, right? Like, because mm. he's basically talking about living, right? Like, okay, so look, basically, you know, if you think about, well, what does this mean? Um, in contrast, this work takes as a starting point, a projection. So we project out and what we project out is a prior understanding of the being of beings, which all human beings have is we have this pre-thematic already always understanding of the being of beings, right? That at the bottom that gives everything its intelligibility in terms of that, right? However, that is usually hidden, right? Mm. Because it's, it's so deep and it's so close. It's so like, so like right, right behind your eyeball, right? That you usually don't see it, you see with it. So it, he's basically saying like, no, let's understand it from the way that we do actually understand it, right? Let's just start saying shit and then, and then start noticing our projections our projection of this understanding, including our projection of our understanding of the being of ourselves, and, and then proceed to analyze the constitution of the being of this being from out of these guiding assumptions. The movement of the work is neither an, a, an ascent towards nor a descent from first principles 
but rather a circular movement in which the guiding projections are gradually clarified through a disclosure of their presuppositions, right? See, this is circling. I mean, this is sitting, <laughs> this is sitting in like, this is sitting in get someone's world, right? This kind of way in where, you know, there's something that you're, some way, something, some problem you're talking about or something you're fucked up about and like you're started to talk about it. And then like, at, at some point you start to, it starts to kind of get clear about there's, oh yeah, this is kind of like this other thing. And then, and then there's this process where you circle back around it. And after you circle back around it, you see more of it, right? Mm. And it starts to, you know, that circumambulation. But, but in some sense, that's, that is the process of becoming a person, right? On some level, like it's the, it's not starting out in advance with the, uh, like I said, ideas or principles, right? No, it's more like start living and start noticing that there's a way that you live and start to notice that, the, that, that, that you're always responding to something. Well, why, mm. why is it the particular something that, and how does it show itself to you, right? Like, like it could be like, yeah, you've been married 12 times. Maybe you're just starting to see that maybe it wasn't them, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, you start to see the, you start to see the, the, um, the understandings that, that, that have the world show up for you and occur for you the way that it does. And I think what normally happens though, is that we get lost in those interpretations as if they're just given and we don't see we don't really see the way we participate and what we bring to it right presupposes an understanding let alone ask that so basically what he's saying is just stay open as you do that and then start to notice it and in noticing it and you keep circling around it which will you'll do naturally it will start the background will start to come to the foreground right and you'll realize like oh I had no idea. I've been turning the whole world into my mother, <laughs> right? And then trying to fix it, but she never does it. And so it just creates this whole other situation. So I marry them and it still doesn't get it. It still doesn't fix her or whatever, whatever the projection is, right? Mm. So I thought that so was that, really, yeah. Go ahead. That's great. So, so you in this process of circling, you open up this field where you have the likelihood or possibility mm -hmm. and that that kind of like is in the room as possibility and then you can aspire to it and then you can transcend right and then yeah. you can you you can go beyond yourself in a yeah. sense yeah and that that's why why practice is so important i think because it, it opens up this realm of possibility and only in that realm of likelihood or possibility, then we can, then we can kind of like harbor this moreness into us, and that kind of like simultaneously brings us to transcend to towards it, yeah, or together with it in a sense, yeah. Um, and and you know when you have a first principle whatever that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's kind of like that's always like that's always like the boundary as well right mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. never go beyond this principle mm -hmm. and then in the buddhist sense when you have absolute nothingness which you sh sh should never turn into a thing in a sense then you have always something you can go beyond so yeah. that's why often these mystics so even even the highest principle let go of it right right Right, totally, totally. And this is this this is this completely reverse thing that Heidegger is doing, mm -hmm. because he does not he does not propose anything. Yeah. He says the question of being is the most ambiguous one, yeah. or the the most mysterious one. Yeah. And then then he just proceeds from that. What what you just outlined so so wonderfully. Right. 
Right. And we, we circumambulate around yes. all of the things that are going on, but we, right. as you said, we, we never pay attention to. Yeah, totally. And like, as you circle around it, you like, you'll get, you'll notice it and, and it'll occur to you in a particular way, but you won't totally understand it. And then you go on and again, you circle. And then when he comes back again, the whole ride, because that shift in understanding, mm -hmm. Effect, like because it's a sh it's a shift at a level of like the way of understanding that it um it basically gives how you respond to things right it's like you, you can only respond to what you understand right it's got to have some kind of understanding so if you see more of it right or if you see that there's something there that you've been responding to but it wasn't it wasn't to that and you're like, oh, there's a that, there's an it. What is that thing? And maybe you don't even know what, what it is that you're pointing to, but there was, you saw more of it, right? And then, and because you saw more of it, um, it it's, it's almost like in a certain sense, it alters the mm -hmm. way that you understand. There's like a shift that happens, not just understanding that, but you're understanding your own understanding at the same time, right? And when that shifts, you start to walk differently and respond differently. And so then you come back around and then that same thing happens, but you, you circle around because you've been walking differently, you come for it and it, it occurs, more of it shows up, right? And you're mm. like, oh, it's da -da 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 -da. Oh, okay, I didn't even, oh, and then I see that I didn't see this and not seeing this is precisely what had it be what it wasn't, right? Like, oh, how did I do that? So I can, you know, and you just do, and then you go on and that alters the way that, and then you circle back around and more of it seen, right? And that's how this kind of, uh, this, um, you know, I, I guess the technical word is, what did he, what did he call it in being in time? Um, uh, existential or ontological existential hermeneutic phenomenology right mm. like and uh, mm -hmm. i just want to say that's in a sense education as well so that bingo. right yeah <laughs> bingo bingo and so there's that kind of way where it's if you start talking about your understanding of the being of beings on one level, it's the, that's the, that's the, the biggest abstraction that you can't get more abstract than that. But on another level, you can't get more concrete than that. Right. Because everything's a being. It's all you've dealt with your thoughts of being <laughs> your faces of being the things of being your past is a being everything's a being right. Therefore, my understanding of being as such, I have to have one. Otherwise, these could not be, beings couldn't be available, right? So to understand the being of beings, on one level, it's the hardest thing to see. That's why you have to do these circles, right? Because that's the way it discloses itself, right? Because a big part of the understanding of being, this is the thing I've appreciated about Heidegger. It's taken me a long time to really kind of understand that this is what he's getting at, that the truth is a, as much about concealment as it is about unconcealment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That like, there's a truth, there's a, there's, there's a truth in that it was concealed and that it was veiled. In fact, it's veiling was part of the phenomena of what allowed it to be right in the way that it was right so when you see that in some sense that that it's concealment got out concealed right and in the presence of that 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 ends up that's those are those kinds of insights that are just like life-changing right because yeah, literally yeah. literally you've altered the very thing that you could say governs every every action that you ever take, right? That mm. is predicated on. And 
usually we do this again in education, right? That you, 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 we, we always, we have some frames and then we go beyond the frame. Yeah. yeah. That sometimes it seems at some point we just stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, right. And, right. and then, then right, f philosophy as a way of life mm -hmm. becomes so important because it helps yeah. you to, to. Yeah. Okay. Well, so what were I, you saying? I said that philosophy was a way of life. Yeah, philosophy is a way of life that helps you go beyond your frames. Yeah. And always helps you to to see what is beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And then and have and and keep the circle going, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an infinite game for sure. And I think when we forget that or we, we lose the practices, then we can also not respond to being anymore. Yeah, totally. And that's in a sense also one facet of the problem of nihilism. Right. Because then, then the whole being collapses into non-being in a sense. Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. also something that's often getting addressed, right? Mm. What that, that being is collapsing into 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 non-being oops this primordial relation mm -hmm. to tools to beings to our world and and that's just yeah you know I, I sometimes mentioned the movies of Terence Malick because they they he really he really wasn't like isn't a reader of Heidegger and he mm -hmm. really tries to have mm -hmm. a gift give the viewer how 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 it is or feels when you have an Heideggerian eye on the world yeah oh yeah oh yeah and just this you know when you when you just see the openness of a landscape or or the beauty of a tool yeah. you know just just or, or how a skillful master is, is using a tool or crafting something yeah. just this primordial yeah. because that's so primordial we, we always it, it precedes our existence tool use precedes us yes and yes. and there's so much yeah. But there's so much practice that we need to keep this going, this circling, so mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. That and and that that's the philosophy. And it's not it's not just. I mean, John Mulvaney talks about this a lot, right? It's not just about propositional knowing, mm -hmm. like uh, exchanging abstractions, uh, abstracted knowledge, or or arguments but it's also about the the other stuff <laughs> right. right well you can start to hear it's like you can start to get a sense in which like there's a constant to, to be is to be in a like something's being disclosed to you right mm. like that's it's constantly the world is constantly disclosing itself to you right and it, it wants to be known it that does. that's also this that's this god wants to be known that's yeah. this 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 motive in the in the in mysticism that i brought up much earlier right. but that's this god wants to be known yeah but he's he, we have forgotten to to look deep enough to mm -hmm. to, to yeah. see him right right because there's something about what, what well what is it what would you say what would you say is, um, why wouldn't we do that? For, for First of all, not, <laughs> not looking, right? Not doing the circles, right? Is mm. not responding is a response, right? Mm. Like in the responses, like what I mean by response is that 
like essentially you're always in everything that you're doing including this word i'm saying right now including like the way i'm saying it that i'm putting my head down like this all of that is in a response to finding myself here as a human being existing inside of an understanding of being that i don't understand right <laughs> there's a there's a, there's every single gesture is a full response to existing right how are we responding in fact that's the thing i've i've really i think that's the key when it comes down to it to, to listening um with in circling, we talk a lot about like, you know, when you train to, to lead circles, I mean, most of it has to do with this deep kind of ontological existential sense of listening, right? Which is a very, very different thing. But what, what a lot of it has to do with is, is through listening to what you're saying and listening to what you're not saying and all the different ways that you, your ears pick up that you're being, right? In some sense, the, it goes, it starts, it starts to be a, a, like a level of depth in listening happens when you start to hear what you may be responding to, right? And it may mm. not be what you're talking about in terms of content, but like if I'm really, really listening, right? Like I'm listening to what you're saying, I'm listening to the way that you're saying it. But, but what I'm watching is I'm watching you respond to being. And then I can listen to like, well, what is it? Based on your response, what can I, then I could start to hear what your understanding of being is, right? Like it, it, you start to hear mm. that all of a sudden, and then you start to ask questions, right? You paraphrase that, you respond to that, right? In that sense it's usually nothing that the person's actually saying, but you're responding to, to something deeper than what they're saying. It's like the Uber saying of what they're, they're saying, but they don't know to say it, right? Because they're in the midst of it. So when you start to respond that and you start to elucidate that starts to come into concealment, it, start, it, it facilitates, that's why, that's why I'm saying this is like circling. It, start, it facilitates those hermeneutic, right? Um, projections that as we start to understand them, they, they start to show their presuppositions, right? They're already understandings. Yep. Mm. It's, and it's, you know, what's interesting about this is, this is, is it's ecstatic. Mm. It's really mm. fun. Like it's really ecstatic, right? The standing out while fully participating while standing out to it that that whole thing is so fun right and rich but what but what would you it what also would you shows find? us how, how, how the human being is kind of like we, we are stretching ourselves out we are we are always outside of ourselves right 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 right, <laughs> right. totally totally yeah we show up and we're already beyond ourselves mm. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are we are, tra we're already transcended. Like, mm. Mm. The, so what do you think? Why, wh what gets in the way of that? Like, why would somebody not do that? Like we could say like, and we'll say, we'll say that that thing that we're talking about is something like authenticity, like an authentic way of being. Mm. We go to like, well, if fallenness and all, all the things that Heidegger talks about as inauthenticity, right? Like, what are our ways of not doing that? And why do we not do that? Especially because it's given this so fun. Why the hell do we, right? Hmm. In fact, why do most people not do it? You know, in, 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 in some cosmological, Um, myths also um you know that this state of closure is either it's in the platonic myth it's the cave or in some in some like a christian framework it's it's these states of hell which you also have in buddhism right 
and they some would say this is kind of like this is an equation with with um, existential states you can be in. Mm -hmm. So why 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 do people fall into hell or in pits of of misery and and suffering? Um, probably because life is hard and we often want to shy away from that, right? Yeah. It's often like, that's instinctually what you do when you see the sun, right? Yeah. You, you can't see it, you, you look away. Or you, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a pain. So it's, it's fun, but it's also, it's also terror in that sense. It, it, it blends us. It's not, we are not, we, we are evolutionary. We are used to look on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> on the ground right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so why are people in the cave i mean in, intuitively what first comes to my mind is is because we are also these these craving creatures yeah that's maybe just because of our constitution we always mm -hmm. want to see things and we always want to yeah stick things in our mouth <laughs> right yeah, totally and <laughs> we're, we're it <laughs> we're it dominant right <laughs> yeah. mm. Mm -hmm. so just that that's why you you at some point the religious traditions identified these cravings yeah that we we have these wills and we have passions these yes drives these passions and all of that and when we follow our passions too much, then we come into these hell-like states. Mm -hmm. um, but simultaneously, if we if we're just ignorant, if if we if we just if we just withdraw from everything, that's also not good because then then the, mm -hmm. we, we won't receive the light anymore. Right. Right. So that's why this existential quest is always good. It's it's always finding the middle ground of of. Yeah. Of concealment and unconcealment, in a right, sense. Right. Because right. if 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 everything becomes unconcealed at once, I think you become crazy because yeah. it's it it's too much. Yeah, totally. You know, you know, uh, beware of wisdom you didn't earn. Yeah. Carl Jung say right. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Don't t stick your, uh, your your finger in the light socket. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So. But if we if we become so disinterested with being that we don't want to tune to it at all, yeah. then it's also the danger that that we fall into uh, ignorance. And yeah. Just just we we have seen this in the last century. If if we let's say forget the presupposition of beings, mm -hmm. so of ontic beings, mm -hmm. but then we can cannot treat each other as person anymore yeah yeah totally so so is it fair to say like i think what i heard you say is one is that we're mostly meat with lots of drives and a in a big mm. and, and very hungry right so one part of it is just the animal nature in us right it's a lot more immediate and then the other part is is essentially pain. It hurts, mm. or it can hurt. Mm -hmm. Right, it can hurt for sure. What What do you think? Why Why are we like that? That we don't want to attune to this ecstaticness of of being. But the one level I want to say is because we're free, right? Mm. And because we're free, the possibility of prison, mm. right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. on some level, I, I, I used to think to myself, you know, animals, they're kind of just naturally enlightened, right? They're not thinking about themselves, right? They don't have regrets. They, they're just totally themselves. And I started thinking about like, you know, actually that's, that's 
that's basically putting my consciousness, that, that's putting Dasein, giving them Dasein, and then assuming that they, because for, for them to be designed and to be animal, oh my God, so they just be neurotic as hell trying to be that way, you know? <laughs> mm. But the, I think it's, I think it has to do with that. I think it has to do with, you know, there's, we, whereas animals have an environment in which they are submerged in their environment, right? We have a world, right? And so um, I, I just have a feeling that that freedom you know, that's kind of staying, it's, you could say that like, you know, what is it to be a human being? It's, it's to, 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 to find yourself standing in the horror of, of the overwhelm of beings, the infinite number of beings, right? And finding a way to stand in relation to all of that. Like, that's the whole thing. Um, and there's something about like, well, one, it like hurts a lot. Um, it's, it's really, it's really like a lot of it. We can think about it developmentally. Like, you know, I think that people who probably have loving parents on some level who are good representations of being, right. I have a feeling that, cause I, that's how I think about, you know, the first womb is, is in the mother's belly, but but the second womb, given how vulnerable we are as infants, like this doesn't, there's like, it, we don't make any, human infants don't make any sense if you compare it with any other animal. Like we have very few instincts, right? We're completely, in every way, we're completely pathetically um, dependent on our, on our caregivers in every way, right? Like no, no other animal is like that to such a degree. And we're like that for a long time, right? So it's like, I think there's our vulnerability and our helplessness, right? Um, if the parents like are good wombs, in other words, they're able to like kind of be attuned and meet the person, not overstuff them and kind of like let their feelings be there, but, but yet still having limb, all the stuff, right? And the child, constantly has the experience of at the end of the day they, they got me they care for me i have a feeling that that over time just gestalts into a a general a generalized sense of being or an understanding of being that has a holding quality has a benevolent quality to it and a sense of okayness um and i think the more that that's present, it seems that people who who have a lot of that, what almost would call basic trust, a non-conceptual trust, that basically that 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 okay okayness is never at stake, right? That at the bottom, at the end of the day, something's holding us in a in a in a benevolent way, right? A non-conceptual trust, just like. You have non-conceptual trust when you breathe, right? You just trust that the next next breath is going to come. You don't think about it, right? And because you mm -hmm. trust it so much, you don't even have to become aware of it. It just goes into the background, right? Mm -hmm. I think people with that are have more of that. There, they can open a lot more to pain, right? I think mm -hmm. they can open up to difference and novelty in ways that somebody who doesn't have that can't, right? Um, because if it's really there, if somebody's really, really there, they could just kind of jump, right? Because if it's like at the deepest level, even if I die, it'll be okay, right? If I have that background sense, my ability to open to the world, right? and to look at it and see it, right, is, is going to be, um, 
is going to be a lot freer. And because I'm a lot freer, I'll be a lot more limber. I'll be more resourceful. I'll learn a lot more. Like, and I just think, I, I think that kind of our, that, that nature, we can open up and, and, and we can actually open to pain, to hard things because, but if that's not there, some level, there's a fundamental sense that being is that which will betray me, right? Because I've noticed that, like if you like if you meditate, next time you meditate, just kind of like see if you can tune into this sense of it's really a sense. We don't leave home without it, but there is just always a sense of the moment. There's a holding quality, right? There's something holding everything together in the way that it is, and there is a way in which I'm comported to that, right? I'm in relationship to that, right? But if that thing is not, or if it's unfriendly, or if it, right, or if it's, if it's incompetent, or if it's dangerous, or any of those kinds of things, whatever, the less that's there, the more I'm going to have a very grasping, um, constantly need to be overworking, ensuring my own survival and my own existence and like all that kind of stuff, right? So I think, um, I think it has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think our parents are like the first local representatives of being. <laughs> and the more being like they are, they're probably mm -hmm. the better off that's gonna be. The less they are, the, the more confusion I'll have. And then my relationship to pain without basic trust is usually going to be some version of um, really like avoiding pain, right? Pain avoidance. But, but so, much of, so much of the good stuff has to do with voluntarily doing things that are uncomfortable, right? Um, and being vulnerable. That's where all of the disclosure happens is, in, is, is like that volunteering sense of opening yourself to something new, to a different way of seeing, like kind of wanting, wanting to not know and to know, right? Like all that, that attitude, right? Is, it has a lot to do with being uncomfortable. Um, mm. If I can't serve, if, however, if like, I don't feel like I can survive because I'm not supported in a deep way, right? Like any kind of discomfort will be, could be the end of me, right? So I think that's a lot of it. And, and we are always looking for this comfort, right? I, I, yeah. One of our, the guys from our reading group brought up the German philosopher Sloterdijk. And he said that for him, even things like cars are kind of like they are representations of the, the womb of the mother. Because you have, you know, you have these comfortable seats and it's all cozy and... And you know you, you're always protected from rain or everything yeah. Yeah. when you have like a king size bed where you can hide under the, the... <laughs> yeah totally and, totally. and it's, it's even even also the, these you know these great mansions that some people have and want mm. when you when you have a lot of money that you mm. feel like you were protected mm. from everything yeah um yeah definitely I, I would say that when you, when you don't have this experience of primordial love, mm. so you, you don't know what agape even is. Yeah. Kind of like this unconditional love. Yeah. I think that that's why, why, why Christianity becomes, became so big. Because mm. there were so many slaves in the, in the Roman Empire. Right that they were craving for this yeah. love in a sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also, by the way, the only thing you can really do because when you, when you are, even what we are doing now, mm -hmm. dialoguing together mm -hmm. and you, you're doing this in good faith, then you're committing to this person making yeah. interpersonal agape, yeah. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Because we, we 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 are tending to each other, and yeah. we are helping us on our 
philosophical way of life, let's right. say. Right. And while we are doing that, in our speech, agape is always already present. Yeah. And that's also this, that's also why it can draw them out. That's then, you know, I don't know, John Lewicki has, you know, a series, and then many, many more people are attracted, are re- attracted to it. Because they, they see something like agape or some, yeah. you give out your teachings. And that's, that's always with a great teacher, I, I think. Um, right. Whoever, Heidegger, right. um, then they, they attract people and they all want to study with yeah. them. Totally. That's, also, that's also, even in the education, mm-hmm. in that sense, you can see a kind of a love beyond it. Yeah, and that's that you know the love between a teacher and his yeah. students. Yeah. So good, and and that's so yeah. good because the teacher really facilitates person making, right? Yeah, big time, big time. It's such a yeah, they really get to right. It's such a mm. privilege, right, to do that, and they you can feel that privilege, that sense of them being grateful right? And their humility around it, right? And their joy around it. Just, it's stunning to be, you know, I've been fortunate because I've had people in my life that have mentored me, right? And I know that doesn't happen for everybody. And definitely our culture is not set up for that anymore, like mentoring. Yeah, yeah. But this starts to get what we, I think we talked about last time, and you made this really good point in our last, our last video, um, where I was, talking about like oh yeah that that how oh i think it's yeah i was talking about how in sociality there's a presupposition in normal social sciences right is that the world becomes social through human being social activity right and there's a blind spot there like the cartesian blind spot there because it's that you're like well doesn't that I, well, if, if it's an end result, right, if social is an end result, how does the world, which apparently isn't social, and the human beings, an individual who isn't social yet, how does it even become, move towards sociality to become social? Like, and as the inquiry start to realize, like, oh, actually, no, being itself is what enables our social relations, right? It's 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 ontol- the ontology itself is sociality right mm-hmm. it definitely is the case for us right so i think what you're pointing to is really right on and then you said something you you connected to an ontologically you could so that's called the interconnectedness of being right in a uh like at a at a uh, relationship way it's like it's it's being as social is that interconnectedness and so mm-hmm communitas community like relationships right is is um is huge when it comes to this right huge when it comes to this as you're as you're so um astutely um reminding me about and putting it that way it's huge and i think that's why i think that's actually like a big way like that's 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 what's held my attention on circling for all these years is that essentially it's circling's about like, how do you be with people? How do we be with each other? Participate with each other such that through our relation, we may walk away from that relation more holistically um, in touch with ourselves and with others in such a way that um, that relationship we got our ability to do that even better, right? Because it's just so, and this is, this is, this is really, I, and I, and I don't think that we understand this. Um, I don't know how we could, but I, the, the, the structural changes to communication with the internet and ma- having so many of those relations mm. on a basic mm. level becoming optional, right? Um, I think it's just, I, oh God, it's just, it's, it's terrifying to, to play that yeah, out because, 20 because years from it's, now, right? It's disembodied, right? And, yeah. and it, it also, it varies me, yeah. but 
it's kind of like it's it's like a projection of our ontology yeah. into that because because we are separated yeah because our ontology of modernity separates us yeah totally into into spirit and and body and, and right. but also but we also have no problem with kind of like these weird dualisms so the virtual world mm -hmm. And the real world, and we, we all accept that more or less. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And and then then everything becomes transactional, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that's why that's why I like things like tea ceremony because, I mean, if you're really like an an on, a practical, ontically blinded person, you can. What is what are they doing here? It's just uh -huh. they are just exchanging tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's not. It's not. It's it's about exchanging tea, but it's, it's so much more in that sense. Um, mm. Because you, you, you always give something more of you right. and you always receive something more. Right. Right. And even, even sometimes the presence in, in, in let's say a dojo in that sense, mm -hmm. or in a tea room, or there's just, there's just so much more going on. Mm. And, if we reduce everything just to transactions, then mm. I think I think that could um, that is yeah. You know, Johannes sent in 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 the in the forum. He posted this video from a video game, mm -hmm. which gets a little bit at this, but it's it's also this this point that that we 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 have this perspectivism that we, we retreat to our own shielded communities. We yeah. don't engage with a larger forum. Yeah. So we, we constantly have half truths. Yeah. Um, and that then this in this, the video game, the AI says kind of like we, we then we have to always create a context from which we can make sense of everything yeah. and it's even they try to do this the companies that they create a context and every every message that's outside of it gets like thrown out mm. wow. that that's the second that's the second thing that i would say is very dangerous yeah. Yeah. when we when we when we don't when we can't commune in communitas anymore mm. like we used to do mm -hmm. and now you can really do this you can like you're not you don't have to engage with everybody everyone yeah. in the community right it's not that it's not this this that the whole community of the town let's say is gathering together in the town yeah. hall we are all discussing issues right. but we are all discussing issues in our little groups yeah Totally. And, cr and creating our half realities and half yeah. truths. Yeah, totally. But, totally. And we are doing this disembodiedly in some online forums mm -hmm. also. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, yeah. I it's... don't know. Did this, this will, I don't know what this will result to. Mm -hmm. Well, it's I'm also, the, the other thing too <laughs> is, is I think that people are experiencing, well, one, one of the things I'm noticing that's dropping, um, I had a, uh, uh, a client of mine came for a course. He was talking about his, his, he has two teenage kids and the Amazon person buzzed the door and dad's like, he was busy. He's like, Oh, can you, can you, oh, can, can you greet the guy and get the package? And the kid was so anxious. He couldn't do it. It's like he was too like just to answer the door and confront a, a another a stranger right was so he was so anxious right and i we had a long conversation about that right because i think it's always been look to answer the door and confront another human being has always been terrifying like there's just, they're just being with other human beings we're awesome and we suck and so much can happen right you could say something that hurts my feelings I can misunderstand you and it'll hurt my feelings in a way that'll have to have me have therapy for six months, who you knows, <laughs> right? Like, or you could say something that'll lighten me. There's, there is just a lot that can happen in just one interaction. But because essentially we've made all those interactions 
um, optional, right? Our nervous system will just do what it does, which will move towards what's easiest. And now we're a couple of generations down, right? To where like kids basically don't have to answer the door <laughs> anymore, right? So like there are our capacity to tolerate the anxiety that is inherently necessary to grow, right? Um, is, is lower and lower. And because it's become less, of, we, we don't have to anymore. Therefore, yeah. right? So I think this is the thing that you're talking about too. It's not just about like being in our groups that we're familiar with, but there's something to the, the, the sense of, of that, being able to be to confront people that you wouldn't like or that get in your way or and to have those conversations. There's so much, there's so much machinery, there's so much stuff that's going on inside of us that gets exercised in the most simple interactions. And all that stuff is really, really going down, right? And I just think that people's people are experiencing a loneliness now and a sense of isolation. Mm. Mm. And my sense is this is and they aren't they aren't attributing it to loneliness i think people are experiencing loneliness and an, an isolation and a desperation right that um has lost its reference point because they've never had it right they've never had the other thing so they call it all these other things if they call it anything at all right but i think people in general are very very isolated so it's like but what do we ultimately, what do we get to commune about at the deepest level? What are we doing when we commune? Well, what we commune on is that we, we, we share design, right? We, we get to be the site for it, to, to, to hold the unanswerable questions together, right? And to know we're going to die and to, and to commune in that way, right? It's, that's what makes us human, right? And so we're be I think we're becoming less and less human. Good, good talking with you. I'm so, I'm so happy that we're, that we get to do this. I, I have a, I have a client I have to jump off on now. So I have to, sure. I have to complete. Yeah. Sure. I, it was a pleasure. I hope we can have our dialogues with Seth and Seth also. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll very, schedule very it soon. again. Perfect. Yeah. Have a nice day, guy. Yeah, you too. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. <laughs>